Okay, we're going to do some questions on transfer pricing. We're only going to do two of them. And I'm going back to the ninth edition. You can see what I've written up here, ninth edition. So we're going to do two exercises from the ninth edition. I've been working out at the tenth edition so far, but follow along. 11.5, transfer pricing basics. Gerbig Company's electrical division produces a high-quality transformer. Sales and cost data on the transformer follow. And I've replicated it right here. The selling price is $40. The variable cost per unit is $21. Fixed cost per unit is $9. And there's a capacity of 60,000 units. So that are features of the electrical division. Here's Gerbig Company here. There's one division electrical. Gerbig Company has a motor division that would like to begin purchasing this transformer from the electrical division. The motor division is currently producing 10,000 transformers each year. Purchasing, sorry, not producing, currently purchasing 10,000 transformers each year from another company at a cost of $38 per transformer. Gerbig Company evaluates its division managers on the basis of divisional profits. And over here you see I put the features of the motor division, volume 10,000 units, paying $38. So it's a matter of we know we're going to have to figure out some transfer price. And what is required? Well, we have two requirements. We'll go through the first one. You can see I've already put them down here, what the features of the requirements are. But number one, assume that the electrical division is now selling only 50,000 transformers each year to outside customers. There we are. A, from the standpoint of the electrical division, what is the lowest acceptable transfer price for transformers sold to the motor division? So for A, that's fairly simple. We have excess capacity. The question is, do we have enough? Well, we can make 60,000. We're currently at 50. The motor division wants 10. So yes, we have enough capacity to meet the requirements of the motor division. So on this one, our transfer price is will simplify to greater than or equal to our variable cost per unit. So our transfer price must be greater than or equal to $21. Why? Because we wouldn't do it for less than 21 because we're not even covering the variable cost. Anything more than that will go towards a contribution margin. And since fixed costs are by nature fixed, it'll go right to the bottom line. So there's A done. B, from the standpoint of the motor division, what is the highest acceptable transfer price for transformers acquired from the electrical division? Well, when we look at it from B's perspective, or sorry, the motor division's perspective, they're already paying $38. So they're not going to pay more than $38, so the transfer price must be less than or equal to the market price they're already getting. So our transfer price must be less than or equal to $38. C, we're motoring through this, aren't we? If left free to negotiate without interference, would you expect the division managers to voluntarily agree to the transfer of 10,000 transformers from the electrical division to the motor division? Why or why not? Well, let's figure out what we have. We have a transfer price that must be greater than or equal to 21, but less than or equal to 38. Now, every dollar higher than 21 is in the electrical division's best interest. Every dollar less than 38 is in the motor division's best interest. So there's a wide range, a $17 range in which they can negotiate, and it's in every, every, every point along that line is in both their best interest, which means it's in the company's best interest. So yes, I expect them, if left to their own devices, to, to come up with a transfer price. D, from the standpoint of the entire company, should a transfer take place why or why not? Well, for the first question, we can answer it with just yes. Yes, a transfer should take place. On the surface, it is beneficial for the electrical division and beneficial for the motor division, which means it's beneficial for the company. But let's put a number to that. Let's go to the extreme and say, okay, look, let's say the electrical division supplies to the motor division for $38. So the motor division is no better off, but it's no worse off. So it's indifferent. But the electrical division is using some uh, spare capacity to sell an extra 10,000 units it wouldn't have sold anyways. And those 10,000 units will be sold 
at a contribution margin of $38 minus the 21 of $17, which means for the company as a whole, it is an increase in operating income of $170,000. Now, for every dollar cheaper than 38, some of this $170,000 will be split between the motor division and less to the electrical division. This full 170, at $38, the full 170 shows up in the electrical division. It can be shown, step by step, that as we go from 38 to 37 to 36 to 35, all the way down to 21, all we're doing is we're taking the 170 that accrues here and the zero here. For every dollar difference, we're transferring $17,000 over here, or sorry, $10,000 over here. So if we went to 37, the motor division would show 10,000 extra in contribution margin, in, uh, sorry, in segment margin. And the electrical division would show 160. So overall, the organization benefits by an extra $170,000. Let's go on to the second question. And it says, assume that the electrical division is now selling to outside customers all of the transformers it can produce. And we go through the same scenarios. A asks us to, let me just change the color that we're working with so we have a different contrast. A says, from the standpoint of the electrical division, what is the lowest acceptable transfer price for transformers sold to the motor division? So for A, we need a transfer price. Well, our transfer price must be greater than or equal to our variable cost per unit. We know that. But look, we're at full capacity now. So if I'm going to take 10,000 units away from the market and sell them internally, I need to be compensated for that. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to, I'm going to add to that my lost contribution margin, whatever I lost, divided by the number of units. Now, when you're at full capacity, we're going to find that the lost contribution margin times the number of units is the same as the number of units. But let's go through it. So it's got to be greater than or equal to what's my variable cost per unit, $21 plus. What's my lost contribution margin? It's $40 minus the 21. It's $19 per unit. 40 minus 21, I'm losing 19, times 10,000 units. And I'm going to spread that loss over 10,000 units. So the tens cancel, and we have 21 plus 40 minus 21. We can see that our transfer price must be greater than or equal to 40 because we're already getting 40. In fact, whenever a division is at full capacity, we don't have to go through this whole process. We can automatically say the transfer price must be greater than or equal to the price that we're already getting in the market. B. B is the same thing from the standpoint of the motor division. What is the highest acceptable transfer price for the transformers acquired from the electrical division? For B, it doesn't change. We can simply just infer that the transfer price must be less than or equal to 38. Remember, from the buyer's perspective, it's less than or equal to the market price under all conditions. So there's B. C. If left free to negotiate without interference, would you expect the division managers to voluntarily agree to the transfer of 10,000 transformers from the electrical division to the motor division? Why or why not? My answer here would be no. Why? Because you cannot simultaneously have a transfer price that is both greater than 40 and less than 38. For the electrical division to transfer it even a penny less than 40 is a loss to them. It's not in their best interest. And for the, the purchasing division or the motor division to pay anything more than 38, even a penny, is also not in their best interest. And since it's in neither division's best interest, it's not in the company's best interest. So I think we can answer D fairly quickly. From the standpoint of the entire company, should a transfer take place, why or why not? The answer would be no. But let's quantify that no. What would happen if a transfer did take place? And let's say it take, took place at $38. Well, from the motor division, there would be no difference. No difference at all. However, the electrical division would have to redirect 10,000 units, of which they're getting $40 for, 
and redirect them inwards and only get $38. So there is a loss of $2 times 10,000 units equals $20,000 in lost contribution margin, which means lost operating income. You can also reason it the other way around saying, well, let's let the electrical division sell it internally for 40 bucks. So there's no difference for the electrical division, but the motor division is now paying $2 more. $2 times 10,000 units means they're spending another 20,000 in cost of goods sold. It'll lower their contribution margin by 20,000. Overall, the organization would suffer with a total loss of 20,000 on their contribution margin which means 20000 lower on their operating income. Okay, carrying on, one more transfer pricing example. Let's go to 11.6. Still working on the ninth edition here. Transfer pricing situations. In each of the cases below, assume that Division X has a product that can be sold either to outside customers or to Division Y of the same company for use in its production process. The managers of the divisions are evaluated based on their divisional profits. And this is the information we're given for Division X. We're given Scenario A and Scenario B. Capacity of 100,000 under Case A. We're already at full capacity. We have sales of 100,000 units. Our selling price is 50 bucks. Our variable cost per unit is 30. Our fixed cost per unit is 8. And under Scenario A, Division Y wants 20,000 and is already paying 47. Under condition B, we have spare capacity of 20,000 units, which is just what Division Y wants. So there'll be some transfer price here, but I doubt there'll be one here. But let's just go to the problem and see what's being asked. Required, refer to the data in case A above. Assume that $2 per unit in variable selling costs can be avoided on intra-company sales. Hmm, that's interesting. If the managers are free to negotiate and make decisions on their own, will a transfer take place? If so, within what range will the transfer price fall? Explain. So our variable costs per unit are going to change. So that's interesting. So we still, because we're at full capacity, our transfer price must still be greater than our variable cost per unit plus any lost contribution margin divided by the number of units. So it must be greater than or equal to our variable cost per unit, which is how much? 30, but hang on now. We're told that we can avoid $2 in selling costs if we sell it internally versus externally. So our variable cost per unit isn't 30 anymore. For internal purposes, it's $28. However, our loss contribution margin is still our loss contribution margin. So what are we losing? We're losing $50 minus the 30 because that's what we're using to sell outside for. So we have to keep the same 30. We don't save the two bucks by selling outside. So we do experience $30 in variable costs. We are getting 50. So we're going to lose 20 bucks per unit times the 20,000 units that Division Y wants. However, we get to spread that cost over 20,000 units. You can see that the 20s cancel. So it's 28 plus. The difference between 50 minus 30 is 20. So our transfer price must be greater than or equal to $48, which is our 50 minus the $2 we save. However, from the buyer's perspective, on the other hand, let's have a look at the buyer. The transfer price must be less than or equal to whatever they're paying in the market right now, which means the transfer price must be less than or equal to $47. And that's for the buyer. Well, it doesn't take much to see that that situation cannot hold. You cannot have a price that is both greater than 48 and lower than 47 at the same time. There is no deal. It's in no one's best interest, which means it's not in the company's best interest either. So we can go on to number two, where we do have some capacity. So let's see what's required there. I think I know what's required, but let's just read. Refer to the data in case B above. In this case, there will be no reduction in variable selling costs on intercompany sales. If the managers are free to negotiate and make decisions on their own, will a transfer take place? If so, within what range will the transfer price fall? Explain. Well, let's start again with what we know. 
or the seller, it, our transfer price must be greater than our variable cost per unit. Now we're on case B, so don't use this information here. We're going to use this information on this side. We're on case B. Our variable cost per unit is $20, plus our lost contribution margin. Well, we have the capacity to make the $20,000. We don't have to redirect anything, so we're not going to lose any contribution margin for those 20,000 units. So as long as the transfer price is greater than 20, the seller benefits. What about the buyer? Again, the transfer price, one condition only, must be less than the market price they're already paying. So the transfer price must be less than or equal to the market price on this side is 34. And this is the buyer. So will a deal take place? Absolutely, yes, a deal will take place because we have a situation where our transfer price must be less than or equal to 34, but greater than or equal to 20. So there's a wide range in here where any penny above $20 and any penny below $34 is in both the division's best interest. 2001, the seller, well, that's not really fair. It's not a good division, but it doesn't matter. The seller still benefits with every single penny. So the best way to figure out on this $14 range where to go is to add, uh, is, is to divide it by two and split it and say, okay, there's a $27 transfer price. So it is in the company's best interest as well. Easy peasy. That's it.